We declare that the spirit of the independent Asian documentary filmmakers is alive and one day it will soar with the wind. Welcome to Made in Japan, Yamagata 1989 to 2021. In this program, you will watch 10 Japanese documentaries which are uh, from the previous Yamagata International Documentary Film Festival. Some of you might not know about the festival, so let us summarize what the Yamagata Film Festival is about. I'm Ono Seiko, and the guy sitting next to me is uh, Aaron Garo. What? We've been married 25 years. <laughs> yes, we used to work together. Yeah, we worked at the Yamagata Film Festival together. Yeah, right. And it's uh, still together. Yes, yes. Yeah. And uh, I started working at the Tokyo office uh, of the festival from 91 as a staff which required multiple tasks such as like working on entries and uh, negotiating with the filmmakers and guests and uh, managing films and personnel, looking for sponsors and as well as uh, selecting films for the international competition. And after 97, uh, I uh, organizing uh, sub uh, programs such as like Yoris events, Robot Kramer, uh, Newsreel, Chris Marker, and uh, also uh, editing the Yamagata Festival's publications became a part of my work. And then uh, right after the festival of 2003, I officially left the festival because we moved to here Connecticut, and uh, but I still uh, help out the festival on and on off, and uh, also run a distribution company, Zaka Films, handling Japanese documentaries. Mm. And uh, what are you doing? Mm. So uh, again, my name is Aaron Jero. Uh I'm kind of like one example of one of the particular characteristics of the Yamagata Film Festival in that it's long had a kind of close connection with people who study and write about uh, cinema quite seriously. Uh, so I was actually in Japan uh, doing my dissertation research uh, when in 1993 I was uh, brought in uh, primarily to do translation uh, of some of the catalogs. Mm -hmm. uh, I also was <clears throat> working on the Daily Bulletin, which is kind of like the the, the daily daily uh, newsletter which is put out uh, during the festival. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> After that, I was put on you know, the, the permanent staff uh, or the regular staff uh, for the 95 Film Festival. I was uh, primarily in charge of uh, coordinating uh, the Asia program. Uh, Fujioka Asako and I were uh, central in kind of putting together what is now called uh, New Asian Currents. Yep. Um, uh, but I was also, for instance, um, uh, editing uh, the uh, publication, the journal of the film festival, which was a uh, documentary box. <clears throat> uh, after 95, I still continued uh, editing uh, documentary box for a number of years, uh, but I had to finish my dissertation. I took up an academic position. So I largely uh, left the film festival. Um, but as I like to say to people, once you're involved with the Yamagata <laughs> Film Festival, you never are not involved. <laughs> so even now we're doing this. Yeah. <laughs> but these people like you, like mm. scholars, and mm. they are like a became like a great professors. Mm. Yeah. So you know, uh, Daryl Davis and and especially Marcus Nornis. Mm -hmm. uh, Marcus is a professor at the University of Michigan. Uh, so on the one hand, you know, Yamagata has this kind of close relationship uh, with kind of like the academic and critical community. Mm -hmm. Mm. Right. Mm. And the uh, Yamagata Film Festival mm. has like a two offices mm -hmm. and yeah. Tokyo office and Yamagata office. Mm. And we are working at the, you know, Tokyo, Tokyo office. office. Yeah. 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 And uh, uh, the first Yamagata Film Festival was an event to commemorate the 100th anniversary of 
uh, Yamagata city uh, far north from Tokyo. Mm -hmm. That and, was 1989. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the mm -hmm. first one mm -hmm. is yeah, and and then uh, there like uh, the initial office was located at the like something like a, a international relations section of Yamagata city. So uh, the working for the festival is uh, mainly like a city officers mm. and then uh, they really, you know, they had nothing to do with the films and the festivals or mm. so they visited uh, Ogawa Shinsuke and Ogawa Productions and uh, Ogawa-san is uh, one of the most important documentary filmmakers in Japan mm -hmm. and he was living and his he and his crew uh, they are living in Yamagata at that mm -hmm. time yeah. and so uh, with uh, his advice uh, they hired uh, professional people mm -hmm. to organize organize it and that was uh, Cinematrix and uh, distribution company run by uh, Yano san Yano Kazuki mm -hmm. and was entrusted to be the Tokyo office. And it's because of that uh, the festival had been developed by the public and uh, private mm -hmm. organizations and uh, there are so many interesting, uh, unique things are created, mm -hmm. uh, such as like uh, the way of selecting films for the international competition. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so, you know, obviously there are, you know, sidebars, retrospectives, mm -hmm. which are uh, put together by, you know, scholars, historians, people who really uh, know the subject. Uh, but what's really interesting is that, especially the international competition, is selected uh, by, in some ways, both these professionals, uh, but also volunteers. Yeah. Uh, and plus Yamagata city officers. And some of the, yeah. yes, the, 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 the bureaucrats. Um, <laughs> but, uh, so I was participating with the selection of the international competition in 1995 mm -hmm. and you know we got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds right, of right. Uh, of uh, <clears throat> submissions uh, and initially it's the Tokyo office uh, the people working there plus a committee of three uh, uh, established film critics who mm -hmm. look at them uh, and narrow it down to like, like a like narrow it down to about, approximately like a 50, 50 or so yeah years, yeah so the Yamagata side had to watch all you know fifty the 50, documentaries, yeah. mm -hmm. and then the final meeting uh, took place at the Yamagata City Hall, mm -hmm. and we all get together and it's discussed each, about each film, mm -hmm. and then uh, I think it's the Yamagata people are uh, open and frank about mm -hmm. their feelings, mm -hmm. and so. Uh, I don't like this documentary because the woman is a sleazy mm -hmm. or uh, this documentary is just way too long and it just made me sleepy. So uh, we sometimes like uh, try to mm. convince them yeah. like uh, we should select this documentary because this is not what you saw. This is about like uh, the about the illusion of a reality or something, you know. Mm -hmm. and, um, but uh, the selected films uh, for the international competitions are not always the ones that we expected, but sometimes those films won the grand prize. <coughs> so they had the foresight. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, when I was uh, helping with the selection in 95, you know, that, that final meeting is really quite fascinating. Yeah, because, it is. So for instance, there was this one film, which I really liked. I thought it was really uh, very uh, kind of uh, almost analytical about documentary, but you know, I just could not convince uh, the people on the Yamagata side mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. to vote for it. And I could have pressed it. I could have just kept on arguing and arguing for it. But that, in the end, is not what Yamagata is. The it really is, you know, these professionals, but also volunteers, uh, these city officials, and uh, you know, people from the Tokyo office to get together and try to 
achieve a consensus. And the result is therefore a selection, which is not like that you find in a lot of other festivals where it's, you know, a dictatorial director who yeah. decides everything or a small yeah. group of people who decide not everything. About about the <laughs> yeah. So it really is, you know, just a regular, you know, film fans and, you know, professional critics and uh, getting together and achieving a consensus. And the result is actually a really fascinating uh a variety of films. There are some really difficult, very long films. Right. We picked a really long one in 95. <laughs> uh, but also some, you know, popular films. And sometimes it's those that actually end up winning the, the awards. Yeah, and mm. also, like, uh, these films uh, mm. didn't have any Japanese subtitles. Mm. Uh, only, like, uh, English subtitles. Yeah, yeah. For Japanese people, like, yeah. you know, even for us, yeah. it was not really easy to, mm. like, a real you know, like, uh, English subtitles titles yeah, and yeah. judge the you know about the film and so but it was uh it was exceptional experience for mm -hmm. me and it, it it's just so fun to be there mm -hmm. yeah yeah so uh i think it's a you uh you are studied out from 93 you know you said like as a yeah, yeah. Uh, you know translator yeah, for yeah. the daily bulletins mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. uh, japanese documentaries yeah. catalog yeah. and uh, they actually the daily bulletins the idea first idea actually came from ogawa-san oh really okay. yeah mm -hmm. and it's because a couple of years before mm -hmm. the first film festival mm -hmm. like uh, he was invited by uh, the Berlin Film Festival okay. mm -hmm. and with uh, his documentary like a Japanese village like a Furuyasuki Mura. Yes, yeah, yes, yes. Yeah. So he was very impressed you know by them mm -hmm. uh, print the daily news every day mm -hmm. and so he brought the idea back to Yamagata mm -hmm. But and then then he gather like a uh, volunteers and it, you should make uh, you know a daily news like this. Yeah, and they are pretty much perplex, you know. Yeah, mm -hmm. be volunteers, mm -hmm. you know, like a walk on like a daily news mm -hmm. for the festival. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like a struggles to organize like the international you mm -hmm. know festival mm -hmm. for them. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I don't know how it uh, is in Berlin, but uh, at the time, but uh, it's not just you know uh, you know one sheet of paper which is you know announcing what's showing that day or changes in film times or things like that. Uh, it really is a publication with interviews, sometimes articles by critics, right. uh, and it's in English and Japanese. Mm -hmm. uh, so unfortunately, in '93 they kind of overdid it. So uh, basically, uh, myself and and one of one of my friends was basically stuck in the Daily Bulletin office for right. most of the film festival, just translating and translating and translating. Yeah, that's a translation is always you know done at the last minute. Yeah. So it was a really tough part. You know? Yeah, because most of the content was actually planned in Japanese, and therefore we just had to sit there. So. I ended up saying, oh my God, this is just taking so much time. I'm going to write an article for the Daily That's Bulletin for you. because it's faster than having to translate yeah. somebody else's thing. Yeah, so, it's so. definitely. So. And it's also uh, as uh, expert on mm. Japanese films. Mm. And mm. Could you just tell them like about uh, Oga Shinsuke briefly and Japanese mm. documentaries? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, I'm not the expert. Obviously, we should be talking with Marcus Nornis about that. Um, but uh, obviously, uh, Ogawa Shinsuke is really one of the most central figures uh, in the development of Japanese documentary, especially uh, after uh, World War II. Yeah. Uh, he, like many others, was involved uh, with a commercial uh, film studio, uh, Iwanami Productions. Uh, but already there, they started thinking about ways of uh, working against kind of commercial uh, uh, documentary production and also to move away from what was often like the PR film, the public relations film, uh, towards a more committed uh, and also a, a form of cinema that's kind of more cinema verite, but mm -hmm. what's fascinating is this is 
going on at the same time. It's not following cinema verite. It's going on parallel to what's going on. And so in the 1960s, for instance, uh, Ogawa goes uh, independent. Uh, and as a committed documentarist, he starts filming political movements, most famously uh, the efforts by farmers uh, and mm -hmm. students to protest the building of the Narita mm -hmm. airport. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but what's famous about uh, that series of films is that Ogawa, after a while, kind of realizes that I'm filming farmers, but I don't really know them. Mm -hmm. Uh, so he kind of like just packed up everything, moved off to uh, Yamagata and started farming. Yeah. Uh, setting with his up crew. With his crew. Yes. Uh, I mean, they made films about themselves for him. Living um, together. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. So in some ways, Ogawa's ended up creating a model which I think ended up being very, very influential, not just in Japan, but also in Asia, mm -hmm. uh, especially through the Yamagata Film Festival, which is uh, a kind of committed documentary where uh, it's, it has a communal aspect, mm -hmm. uh, but it's also, you don't just go in, film your subject for a few hours, and then you've got a film. It's like you have to be with those people. Uh, for a long time. Um, and, you know, Ogawa really was quite central to the development of the film festival. Right. But also, if you see uh, uh, a movie capital, Eiga yeah, Miyaku, right. uh, yes. obviously o Ogawa uh, fe features there quite prominently, but especially uh, the last half an hour or so of the film is <clears throat> centered on the Asia yeah. Symposium, and that's really Ogawa. Yeah, yeah that film mm. was like uh, the filmed record of the first mm. Yamagata yeah. Film Festival. Mm. So, uh, if filmed, you... filmed by Ogawa Productions. Uh, yeah, well. yeah, right. Yeah. And it's uh, directed by Izuka Toshio. Yes. And mm. it's, uh, he's a member of Ogawa Productions mm -hmm. at that time. And so if you watch like a movie capital, mm. you really can see how the festival started mm. and how the festival became a magnet. Mm. you know, for the Asian filmmakers. We also see problems. They had problems with interpreters, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so he's still trying to get things started. Uh, yeah, right, mm. right. But as you can see with the Asia Symposium, uh, one of the big problems was the first festival didn't feature any Asian films in the international competition. And mm -hmm. what do we do about that? Uh, I mean, one thing we can talk about is, on the one hand, uh, there's always the discussion about should we have a Japanese film in the international competition? Um, but I think the more core issue is uh, how can the Yamagata Film Festival function uh, as a leader in helping promote and develop documentary in Asia? Mm -hmm. uh, so the next festival in 91, there was an Asia program. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in 93, uh, Fujioka Asako and I were the coordinators of the Asia program yeah. then. I think it's like, a, uh, that's a new Asian current. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I think that's kind of like a, uh, another turning point mm -hmm. for the festival. Yeah. It's because before that, like a former like Asian program, mm -hmm. There was just Asian program. It, it, it didn't even have a name. For yeah, that. yeah. And it's also it didn't have Japanese documentaries. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you and Fujioka san start including Japanese documentaries mm -hmm. in your program. Yeah, yeah. And that was really huge leap. Yeah. And. Uh, uh, yeah, so 95 was very much a transition year yeah, for, right, for, for the right. Asian mm -hmm, section. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, still in 95, uh, we were not just, you know, showing the films that had been submitted, but we were actively searching out films because right. we couldn't just guarantee we, it wasn't guaranteed that we'd be getting the films we needed. So we really were phoning around, going to festivals, trying to find films. Um, and we were trying to be as representative as possible, bringing in films from you know, Laos, for instance, uh, which no one had ever heard about. Um, uh, we also started to change the conception of what Asia was mm -hmm. and started including, for instance, uh, Central Asia and even the Middle East. Mm -hmm. uh, so the definition of, of Asia expanded. Uh, but um, we also m started the grounds for uh, 
creating a program which became something which documentaries around Asia wanted to submit mm -hmm. their films to. So in subsequent years, the programmers didn't have to search out films per se. Uh, they could, uh, you know, have films be submitted and 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 uh, be guaranteed to have a great selection because so many people wanted to have their works shown mm -hmm. in New Asian currents. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it's uh, in '95 mm -hmm. the director of uh, the New Documentary Film Festival, Real. Mm -hmm. In Switzerland, mm. he the director came to the Yamagata mm. in '95, and uh, he actually asked you to recommend some Japanese documentaries mm. yeah, and yeah. films, and mm. uh, you said Kawase Naomi. Yes, and it was mm. I was kind of thrilled to hear that because mm. I really loved her like mm -hmm. racing, yeah. and uh, remember that. Yeah, that? yeah, yeah. So. Uh, Obviously, we did not discover Kawase Naomi because uh, she had already won some yeah. awards within Japan. Uh, so she had already gained a following within Japan. But Yamagata, I think, was one of the means by which she became uh, more noted uh, abroad. Uh, but even there, we were kind of just trying to grab films. Yeah. So we ended up showing two of her films, yeah, both right. Embracing and, and Katatsumori. Yes. And in some ways, you know, Embracing should have been shown at the previous 93 Yamagata, because uh, it was a 92 film. Uh, mm -hmm. So again, we were kind of still just kind of gathering films, but this was a filmmaker who we were really, really excited about, especially a, a young generation who was uh, using documentary, uh, not necessarily for taking up uh, political movements, um, but for really thinking about themselves, about their family, uh, the, the genre, you can say, of, of personal documentary. Uh, but Kawase san was doing it with a sensibility. Uh, that at the time was very centered in her uh, use of small gauge, uh, eight millimeter and 16 millimeter. Uh, so later on with the 35 millimeter films, it kind of changes. Uh, so what's interesting is 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 the wield. Uh, so Mao the wield, yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, you have to blame me for the English title for that. Uh, <laughs> well, but it's a, you know Japanese title is a Somaldo Mono. Yes, it's a tale of Somaldo, and it's no one knows about what a yes. Somaldo means. So, so I, it kind of a, you know fits. Yeah, so I, I aimed for an old English word that means somewhat the same thing that your average English person would not really know mm -hmm. uh, what it meant. But that film, for instance, it's made after her. Um, uh, commercial feature 35 millimeter debut, uh, Suzaku, Moi, yeah, Moi no Suzaku, which won the uh, Camera d'Or at mm -hmm. Cannes. Uh, but you can see in Suzaku, there's a moment where she almost kind of returns to her eight millimeter style. And mm -hmm. in some ways, Somao do Monogatari, or The Wheel, is kind of her return to documentary after a fiction film, saying, let's stay in the same place. Uh, and let's film some of the people mm -hmm. who were around when I was making this fiction film mm -hmm. uh, and really get into that community mm -hmm. a lot more, kind of returning to uh, uh, her old style or some of her, her old technology. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's also in this program, mm -hmm. uh, you can also watch mm -hmm. uh, uh, Living on the River Agano, directed mm -hmm. by uh, Sato Makoto. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, there, there is a legendary episode mm -hmm. about like uh, Sato Makoto, because uh, in 89, the first mm -hmm. film festival, like, uh, he was kind of uh, preparing for his uh, first documentary mm -hmm. film with his crew, and so he came to the you know the festival but he was there too poor to afford mm. accommodation so uh, they pitched the tents under the bridge and they by, by the river yes yeah by the, mm. under the river yeah, uh, under by, the bridge and mm. by the river mm. and then uh, they uh, went to the festival like mm. from there every day mm -hmm. and then uh, next to festival in 91 uh, mm. he brought his rough cut oh, yeah. of the liver on the uh, living on the, on the river, river I don't know. Yeah. and then uh, he kind of showed it 
and semi-officially, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, he had a, a Q&A in front of uh, Yanagisa Toshio mm -hmm. and Suzuki Shiroyasu mm -hmm. and other leading Japanese you know, filmmakers. Mm -hmm. And Sato-san uh, appreciated their feedbacks, mm -hmm. but I heard they are pretty harsh. Okay, <laughs> and it is his final version mm. is uh, uh, received a lot of awards throughout the world, mm. including mm. Uh, Yamagata. Mm. Yeah. And uh, I think it's uh, this episode is kind of uh, indicated uh, potential commitment what the film festival should work on. Mm. Yeah. And so since then. Uh, you know, they had more and more interactive workshops yeah, and yeah. Uh, discussion or conference, and there mm. is even like a Yamagata rough cut. Yes, okay. yeah, yeah. So filmmakers like bring like a, their own unpolished films and then show them, you know, mm. share it with other filmmakers and mm. audience, mm -hmm. and then get inspirations or uh, feedbacks yes. and uh, like opinions about mm. that. And also, there is another tough one: is uh, uh, filmmakers in residence, uh, and, mm -hmm. and it's mm. called. Documentary dojo. <laughs> dojo yes. yeah, it's not dojo do for karate, but yes, dojo it being a place yeah. where you train martial yeah, right, arts. Right. Yes, yes. And it was, yeah. this project is reorganized mm. by Fujioka Asakusan, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. and so I think it's a. Uh, that's also that episode is mm. really uh, important for the festival. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can see it again with uh, a movie capital, and especially Ogawa uh, in that film. You know, the the he's he's not simply worried about the state of you know uh, Asian documentary in terms of censorship, which is obviously an issue, but also in terms of we need to you know. Uh, foster a new generation. So in some ways, Yamagata from the start had a kind of educational mm -hmm. uh, side to it. Uh, let's let's find young filmmakers and let's bring them here so they could talk to other filmmakers, they can watch other films. And so you really can see with uh, certain uh, Chinese documentaries or certain uh, uh, Korean documentaries, uh, that you see the influence of Yamagata and especially Ogawa. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's not just Asian documentaries. So we all know about Barbara Hammer. Uh, yeah. And, and you to talk about well, it. Well, no, you can talk about it. She, she's yeah. associate yeah. Pro producer on that film. But her, uh, Barbara came to Yamagata and learned about Ogawa Productions and decided to make a movie about Mm -hmm. uh, Ogawa Productions called Devotion, which which Seiko helped produce. Um, <laughs> but that's just one example of how Yamagata didn't just show films, mm -hmm. but help in some ways indirectly produce films. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah Byung Yong Ju is a Korean documentary yes. filmmaker. Yeah. Uh, she called Yamagata Festival. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like a school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so if you uh, the list of the, of the made in Japan mm -hmm. and uh, there are more films and yeah. uh, you would talk about other films and yeah, well, one thing to talk about perhaps would be uh, the new God. Uh, oh God. By, by okay. Chia San. Uh, Chia San. Uh, so that showed in 99. So I wasn't uh, programming that film, but I was still editing mm -hmm. uh, Documentary Box. So we have an interview uh, with uh, Chia San in Documentary Box, which is available online. You can, you can, you can watch it uh, or read it online. Um, and uh, in some ways that was... Uh, really, I think, an important film, uh, both in some ways for Yamagata, but also, I think, for Japanese documentary. Uh, uh, on the one hand, uh, it kind of uh, symbolized the issue of video. Because, right. uh, you know, in the 1990s, that's precisely when there's a big transition from shooting on film to shooting on video. But the international competition for a long time was still stuck in film. 
Right, right. That's it's. I think it's, that's uh, the influence of Gashinsky, mm. like the style. Yeah. And like uh, documentaries should not uh, made like uh, easily or quickly. You know, mm. like it took like years and years, and finally mm. make a documentaries mm. and something. So. We kind of like try to show that kind of documentaries yeah, yeah. for the international competition. Mm. So even uh, in the international competition, if a film was made on video, a film print had to be made in order to show uh, in the international competition, that's which was kind of yeah. ridiculous. Yeah, right, that right. changed later. But that meant that the Asia program was actually uh, the only kind of competition program within Yamagata that accepted video. Mm -hmm. uh, and Tsuchiya's film, The New God, is very much a video-made film. Yeah. Uh, in part because Tsuchiya-san himself is an activist and is uh, a core member of what's called Video Act. Uh, uh, so the, the potentials of video as a kind of activist uh, format uh, uh, <clears throat> was one thing that kind of became important for uh, 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 New Asian Currents. We also showed, for instance, the Soul Video Collective as well. Right. Um, but at the same time, that film is interesting because it's also kind of uh, has one foot in personal documentary. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, one of the problems we had, uh, especially in, in uh, New Asian Currents, was, you know, it just seemed that we did not find the kind of politically or socially committed Japanese young filmmakers that were evident in the older generation of Ogawa and Tsuchimoto Noriaki. Um, uh, so finding, you know, Tsuchiya-san was one thing because here's someone who's, who's definitely politically active. But we can't deny that the dominant form amongst lots of young Japanese filmmakers kind of personal documentary itself had its own politics. It was a way of thinking through oneself and thinking through one's identity. Uh, and that film, I think, uh, The New God, blended those two in a really mm -hmm. interesting and fascinating and actually entertaining way. Yeah, it's way. a lot of yes. It's a yeah. fun film. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and it won an award as well. Uh, so that... I think was an important film for me in thinking through the changes mm -hmm. uh, in Yamagata and what was going on, especially amongst the young people uh, at, at the time. Yeah, but it's A2, you know, directed by uh, Mori Tatsuya. Mm -hmm. And that's actually the, the first video work was shown yeah. mm -hmm. you know, at the international mm -hmm. competition mm -hmm. because you, that's as you said was before mm -hmm. like only films. Yeah, yeah. So but this is about uh the Om. Om yes, yeah. Om Supreme Truth yeah. as it's <laughs> right. called. Yeah. So it's uh uh so uh he couldn't get in like with a uh, film camera, but it's mm, yeah. you know ha has to be like a compact camera, like yeah. a video camera, yeah. you know, inside the Oumu, yeah. uh, and it was uh, follow the uh, members of uh, mm. the Oumu, mm -hmm. and so that was our. I think it's a kind of like a historical um, work. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, was in some ways, you know, Morisan comes out of a different. I mean, he's a slightly older generation from Tsuchiya-san. I mean, he, mm -hmm. he was a classmate of Kurosawa Kiyoshi, and he appears in Kurosawa Kiyoshi's movies uh, when he was a college student. Uh, you know, he's a journalist, but he's kind of a, uh, a committed media mm -hmm. uh, documenter, someone who is uh, committed to taking up stories that the media, especially journalism, does not take up, but in a way that's very self-reflexive and self-critical. Uh, so that film, which is about, you know, this is the Ohm Supreme Truth. These are the people who committed the sarin terrorist attacks. Uh, and he's, he's filming the, the people who are remaining in the cult, though, you know, these were the people who, you know, had not been arrested and they're trying to get on. Um, so it's a very controversial object, uh, subject and no one is going to be filming this uh, in the television uh, journalism. Uh, 
but Morisan comes in and and uses that these new formats uh, precisely because you know even if television news is using video, mm -hmm. they're using big professional video with big crews and things like that. Um, so it's it's very much an alternative, uh, but it's a slightly older generation from Tsujiya-san. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And it's also uh, storytellers. Just oh, yeah. By yeah. Uh, Sakai Kosan mm -hmm. and Hamaguchi Ryusuke. Yeah, yeah. Hamaguchi Ryusuke is the talk of the town. Yeah, the yeah. United so, uh, yeah. not quite sure when you folks will be watching this video, but, you know, he might be an Academy Award winner, you know, uh, for Good. Drive My Car. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, obviously, uh, 2011 and the triple disaster uh, in a prefecture right next to Yamagata, uh, uh, Fukushima, uh, was, you know, really a traumatic event, uh, but also in some ways a very transformative event. So uh, after that, there are lots and lots of documentaries made about what what in Japanese they call 311. Uh, that's the date of the disaster. <clears throat> uh, and Morisan, for instance, right, made, right, made, yeah, made yeah, one. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Funahashi-san also made. <clears throat> so uh, and a number of those films were shown at Yamagata. There was even a sidebar mm -hmm. created at Yamagata to, sh to show some of those films. <clears throat> but um, amongst all those, uh, Sakai-san's and Hamaguchi-san's mm -hmm. film is quite different. Yeah. Because it's really about not the disaster, but, but about how to talk about the disaster, uh, how to narrate it. Um, so it's, it's actually, I think, about four films, mm -hmm. uh, uh, two of which, I guess, I got, got shown at Yamagata. So, right. uh, I think so, yeah. Yeah, so um, some of them are really just survivors of the disaster talking about the disaster. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but Storytellers is different because yeah. it's filmed at the exact same time, but it's almost as if uh, he's, they're taking one step back and saying, okay, we filmed people in the northern region of Japan talking about the disaster. Well, let's take a little bit of a historical perspective and think about how people in the northern region of Japan have told stories historically. <clears throat> so this is about uh, folk tales, uh, uh, but it's filmed in a fascinating way, which I'm still not quite sure how yeah, it's like done. The camera angles or how do they make it? Yeah, I mean, uh, <clears throat> With a group, they, they have multiple cameras, but they set them up so that you can't see the other cameras. But then when they have two people talking, eventually the camera gets in between them. Yeah. But it's not as if anything has changed. It's as if everyone, the flow, the temple flow is... So is the camera is kind of like a ghost or something. Mm -hmm. The ghost of 311, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, but it's it's it's... Even though it's a documentary, it's, uh, I think, also a good lesson for those people who want to study uh, Hamaguchi's work, because uh, there are lots of long shot, long takes. There's uh, lots of dialogue. Uh, uh, there's also a, a lot of uh, uh, introspection on time and narrative, uh, which you see in a lot of his fiction films as well. And that's something just to uh, remind yourselves about that, um, uh, and this goes back to you know the uh, at least the 1950s of in Japan the line between fiction filmmaking and documentary filmmaking is not a strict line that you have a lot of filmmakers who move back and forth, mm -hmm. uh, who make fiction films and then documentaries or documentaries and then, then fiction films. Um, and it, that's one reason why documentary is really crucial for thinking about, especially post-war fiction film. Yeah, and it's in this program also uh, the documentary Komian Ah, it's shown, yeah. and it's Komian is 
Rizal Komian, you cannot talk about Yamagata Film Festival. <laughs> Komian is like a, a pickles shops and restaurant, and pickles shop and mm, restaurant. Mm -hmm. And uh, but uh, at the night of the festival, it's turned into uh, official uh, Yamagata Festival bar. Yeah, and then the atmosphere like floating within the. 135 years old Japanese uh, buildings mm -hmm. were yeah. uh, impressive and uh, after the screening uh, in Yamagata people get together and drinks together and uh, discuss and fights or and have imoni <laughs> and it was and uh, so this documentary mm. was about uh, the history of Komian mm. and it is also uh, the owner of Komian and it's also supporter supporters mm. of the festival but uh, unfortunately this place was uh, destroyed uh, and torn down yes. torn down yeah. in mm you know, 2020, yeah. it's because of like a economic slump, slump under mm. the uh, pandemic. Mm, yeah. So it was kind of like a painful for me to watch yeah. this documentary. Mm, yeah, yeah, it's always bustling the place. Yeah, yeah and you know, uh, I mean, admittedly, like in the 93 festival, I could barely get out of that room, but it was like, was so Aaron, this is your night to go to Komian. And I was like, oh, I can go to <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, because you know that's again one of the the great things about the festival itself. On the one hand, you know, with the international competition, you have you know volunteers and then professionals, right? You know, getting together and selecting. Uh, but the festival itself is not like just the filmmakers are off in one world. Uh, and then regular film goers are off in another world. Komian was a place where they mixed. I mean, you could sit next to Fred, Fred Wiseman if you are yeah. just a, a regular film mm -hmm. goer and, and say, Fred, I think this film is not quite up to your... I mean, you could say that if you wanted to. Uh, and we were so drunk. Yes, yes. yes. So, yeah. so, you know... Um, I mean, it was just a wonderful space. I mean, obviously yeah, the atmosphere is great, but also just the ability to go there and just talk to any kind of filmmaker. Mm -hmm. uh, and that really was... Not only like a filmmaker, it's yeah. also audience and yeah, yeah. press and yeah. it's, uh, film critics and mm -hmm. all together yeah. and was like a wonderful place. Yeah, yeah. And again, that's, you know, really, I think, a core aspect of of Yamagata, creating this kind of community, which kind of bridges these mm -hmm. traditional gaps or tra traditional, right. you know, uh, sectors uh, within the film world. Mm -hmm. uh, Yamagata Festival is also famous for producing many publications. Mm -hmm. And until now, probably it's more than a hundred you know, publications and including like uh, official catalogs and sub catalogs and uh, daily bulletins and uh, and also uh, Sputnik like uh, covers, like uh, reviews, like uh, yeah, shown yeah, yeah. during the festival, mm. shown of films uh, during the festival. The, the film film critics collective too. Yeah, uh, there's a workshop too. Yeah, yeah right. Mm. And 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 a documentary box mm. and documentary box. It was used to be like official journal, YIDF mm. journal, mm. and the idea was actually was born from the uh, very casual conversation between between us. Mm. And then it's uh, because like a uh, Yamagata Film Festival is biennial. So how could, how can we like uh, continuously approach like a uh, few people mm. even in an absent ear? Mm. And so why don't we make uh, like our own magazine? You know, mm. should we covers uh, interviews or articles mm. on trends or issues mm. about the documentaries mm. of the world and Japan. And the writers should be filmmakers or scholars mm. and film critics. And so uh, that's how we made Documentary Box. Mm. And then uh, I think it's uh, 
This is also unique things about the Yamagata Film Festival. Mm. Like, uh, uh, if you have interesting idea, you can kind of like a carry carry out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, yeah. And then mm. it's, I think it's because of Yano San. Yano San mm. is mm. all thanks to Yano San, yeah. Yano Kazuki. Uh, he was the again the director of the Tokyo office, and he was our boss. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, he was kind of like a really didn't tell us what to do, <laughs> and <laughs> because I think it's, he himself didn't know what to do. Yeah. But he was uh, very good to bring the best out of people. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think it's uh, without Yano. Sun, this Yamagata Film Festival would be desperate, like, mm, like mm. A, the present form. Yeah, yeah. and it's uh, uh, most issues of documentary box, and mm. I mean documentary box will discontinue in 2007 because okay. of mm. uh, uh, limited budget, mm -hmm. and, mm. but uh, uh, most of the issues are uh, available at the YIDFF site mm -hmm. in yeah. English and Japanese. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, if you are interested in, you know, please visit the YIDFF yeah. site. Yeah. And uh, the festival took place last year and was uh, even challenging to say that least because that's the first time for them to go entirely online yeah, yeah. Mm. but uh, uh, I think it's because that experience kind of like encouraged them to to show their documentaries more online like this yeah yeah yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. so uh, at this rate uh, I have no idea what the festival will be next year mm. but uh, that's how the Yamagata Film Festival has been, uh, has always been, mm. like a constantly changing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, to get back to some of the publications, yeah. you know, uh, uh, you know, Yamagata in some ways reminds me of some of the Italian film festivals mm -hmm. where uh, they really produce great publications, which are sometimes almost like, you know, great catalogs uh, by critics and, and scholars. Uh, uh, Yamagata is really the only film festival in Japan of any kind of film festival that regularly produces uh, these kind of publications. Mm -hmm. um, and some of which, like uh, Marcus Nornis's and, and Fukushima-san's, you know, uh, Nichibei Ega-san, yeah, right. U.S.-Japan Film Wars, then became an academic book after words um, uh, so especially to me for instance I worked uh, in the 93 festival on the 1960s Japanese documentaries retrospective catalog uh, I still use that in class for yeah, instance. Right. and uh, that was a great series of, of catalogs um, so in some ways I wanted to bring some of that into Documentary Box. So I took over Documentary Box from the fifth issue. Uh, so I tried to make it uh, a little bit more professional in terms of uh, editing style, brought in the Chicago Manual of Style. Right, yes, right. Yes, yes. Yeah, I, yeah, like, uh, yeah, when you join mm -hmm. this Documentary Box, yeah. I think it's a, uh, you lifted up this magazine to the next step, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. because like you bring in like a uh, professional, like a uh, editing style, but uh, you actually came from the academic uh, mm -hmm. field and yeah. uh, but you, I remember uh, you often said like this magazine should be located in between yeah. uh, professionalism mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, amateurism, mm -hmm. academic and non-academic mm -hmm. and uh, so you, you you know, you could make this magazine more academic. You, know, mm -hmm. you came from, and you're still yeah. in the middle of academic. And, yeah. But you didn't. No. And why was that? Well, one reason, of course, is because, you know, the Amagata Film Festival is not an academic institution. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, 
in, in some ways, you know, part of this comes out of our experience in academia, and, and, and Marcus can probably talk about that a lot mm. as well, that uh, especially North American academia has kind of created this wall between uh, scholarship and film festivals. Like, well, film festivals, we don't do that kind of stuff. Mm. Um, but, you know, we were really committed to, you know, trying to uh, uh, create what is now called public facing scholarship. That is, you know, scholars who are really talking to, you know, uh, the general public, uh, but also trying to kind of uh, break down some of those walls between um, the uh, academic world and the world of film fans and film festivals. And since Yamagata, especially with the way the international competition is selected is already in some ways doing that. I thought it was very appropriate that uh, uh, Documentary Box, but also, you know, uh, some of the other kind of publications mm -hmm. also kind of tread this line mm -hmm. and, and work to kind of bridge uh, these gaps between right. you know, the professionals and mm -hmm. the amateurs, mm -hmm. the fans and the scholars. Um, <clears throat> So even when I was editing Documentary Box, you know, I did have some academics write for it, but we also had um, uh, filmmakers writing about their own work or their own countries. Uh, filmmaking uh, loved having all those interviews uh, with, uh, for instance, Japanese documentary filmmakers, but expanding it beyond just directors to include producers, for instance. Um, and I pass the baton to you uh, because it was Seiko who more job yes yes it was Seiko who took over the editor yeah. ship uh, of documentary but, box you know, like we really uh, uh, they're still like asked uh, by uh, foreign organization mm. if they could use like an article from documentary yeah, box yeah. Mm. and so it, yeah. it's uh, uh, still useful and you ended up producing a book Yes, it's really thick. It's just a, it's a partial, you know, of yes. the, um, uh, documentary box. And uh, primarily the interviews, but yeah, uh, yeah, it's just yeah. yeah, Japanese, mm. you know, uh, filmmakers interviewed. Mm. Yeah. So, uh, I think it's uh, by now is uh, people are getting tired of seeing our faces. Don't you think? I I know they want to see another face. Oh, okay. Where where is that? Well, let us let us look for the other face. So here's the other face. <laughs> yes, here's Hanzo. <laughs> Hanzo is our cat. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sorry for this. Sorry, he was sleeping in the bed. I had to oh. wake him up so he could say hello to everyone. Yeah. Yes. So <laughs> this, this is uh, based on a request. From the Yamagata office, you have to put Hanzo in the video. Uh, the, actually, this mission came from Kato-san. Yes, yes. Kato Hatsu, ah, yeah. she's a, a coordinator of the Tokyo office. And uh, so I think we almost accomplished the mission she yes. gave to us. Yes, yes, mission, mission accomplished. Yeah. But we're not George Bush. <laughs> <laughs> So, but uh, thank you uh, for watching uh, this mm -hmm. and yes. uh, uh, the pandemic is, is still ongoing, yeah. so uh, stay safe mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and, you know, and enjoy what Yamagata is because yeah. obviously uh, the selection of films is, is really fascinating. Uh, and as Seiko said, it, it is going to be pointing to new directions mm -hmm. and possibilities mm -hmm. uh, at Yamagata. Mm -hmm. But Yamagata has already had a, an online presence. I, mean, I remember in 95 when we were talking about, you know, putting some of our publications online and things like that. And we did that pretty quickly. So um, uh, check it out. Uh, Yamagata in some ways has always been online. Yeah, yeah. right. And it's also, uh, maybe I should say this, uh, mm. Yamagata office is now a non-profit -pro organization, mm -hmm. but Yamagata City is a still main sponsor for them. Mm -hmm. So uh, we hope uh, you have a wonderful uh, 2022. Yeah. And so... And when the pandemic is over, Hope you can go to Yamagata. Yes, you uh, should, you should. Uh, obviously for the festival, but uh, Yamagata City at least wants you to come as a tourist and spend lots of money. <laughs>
It's a great place to go. Yes. Uh, yes, definitely. Yes. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so so uh, Hanzo from Hanzo and all of us. Uh, hope you have a great yeah. uh, 2022. <laughs> We declare that the spirit of the independent Asian documentary filmmakers is alive and one day it will soar with the wind.